Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We are glad you're listening as always. Now, I know I was gone for a good while, and we played some older shows and interviews, but which I thought were just outstanding, as a matter of fact. I always love when I have a guest, because uh, our guests are so knowledgeable and helpful. Uh, this is actually me, and it's just me today. Uh, I have to be out of town today, so I pre-taped this. I'm going to go through a few emails that had come in when I was getting the backlog from being out. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some things that are seasonal. So while we normally are a call-in show, don't try to call in today. Just go ahead and, I guess, sit back and enjoy. Hope, hopefully it'll be very uh, enjoyable for you. Uh, today I would like to talk about some of the basic things that gardeners ask, that just common questions regarding all aspects of gardening from lawns to trees to shrubs to flowers to vegetables and herbs and things like that. Uh, and I want to start off by just making a comment, and that's a fellow named Ted Fisher, who was a county horticulturist in Travis County over in Austin years ago. Uh, in fact, I followed him, and this was pretty early in my career, uh, I followed him in Austin as the county horticulturist there. Ted used to say, the three things that make the phone ring at the extension office are the three T's, trees, turf, and tomatoes. And that is very true. That is very true. I would probably put it in the order of turf, trees, and tomatoes if we were going to uh, line them up as to just sheer numbers. Uh, lots of questions come in about our lawns. And I always thought it was interesting because the lawn is the one thing people most often call and ask about. Uh, it's the thing they seem most concerned about. But back in my days as an agri-life horticulturist, we would put on educational programs. And I could put on a program about lawns and promote it just like any other program. And the number of people that showed up in the room were always smaller compared to the number that would come for a program on roses or a program on flowers or vegetable gardening, tomatoes, those kinds of things. And I always found that to be interesting. It's the topic everybody wants to know about but I guess it's just not that exciting coming out and listening to a talk on lawns. Uh, but I'll tell you what, uh, there are some principles of lawn care that are very important. And if you are wanting to have success with your lawn, you need to follow those principles. And so we're just going to start off from the top on the ABCs of lawn care. What is the most important things we do? And those three things are mow, water, and fertilize. That is the most important things we do. And believe it or not, I would say if you want a dense lawn, the sink, what do you think is of those three? Mow, water, fertilize. What do you think is the most important of those three? Now, all of them are important. If you never water grass, it's going to die, right? If, it, if you don't get any rain or you don't water it. But So we know these are all important. We know fertilizing can uh, stimulate growth. And with more growth, you can get more density and things. But what's the single most important of those three? I'm going to surprise you and say mowing mowing. Uh, if you think about it, mowing is a pruning process on a lawn. Now, it, it, you may be pruning off leaves uh, as opposed to stems, like when you're pruning plants. You, you do a little bit of stem pruning, maybe, for runners that haven't pegged down. Uh, but think of it as a pruning process. Now, if you were to take a shrub, and let's say the shrub is four feet high, and you cut it back to two feet high. Let's say you cut it back to one foot high. Uh, that shrub will probably survive. Most of our recommended shrubs could take that. Now they're going to look horrible for a long time. You'll start to get some uh, new shoots coming out of those latent buds that are down in the base of the of the trunk and lower branches and it'll it'll eventually can be trained back into a really nice beautiful dense shrub. But what if you just let it grow a little bit and then sheared it and then let it just grow a little bit and then sheared it again? you would create a very, very dense shrub. And that's true of your lawns as well. The most, what would you say is the most beautiful, dense, impressive turf in general that you see? I think it would be a golf course green. And a golf course green gets mowed every day at a very, very low 
low level. I mean, they, it barely grows a sixteenth of an inch hardly. I mean, an eighth of certainly sixteenth or so. Uh, maybe I don't know. It, it's mowed every day. It's so no matter what it grows, it's just they're barely cutting it off at the same level, and nothing can get above that level but it's constant and wow the density now uh, certainly the cultivars they use on golf course greens help for that you couldn't make a green out of uh, coastal bermuda or something but you can make a green out of the super dwarf uh, bermudas but it's the mowing that makes it look good and uh, when i was growing up i wanted to mow as infrequently as possible because i don't like getting out there and having to do that kind of got old right uh, and so i'd like it to get real high and then mow it down low well saint augustine's kind of forgiving it uh, meaning that if you cut it down halfway uh, of its height, it's gonna still be green pretty much. Uh, it, it just does, a, it's pretty good about that. But some grasses, like some of the zoysias and uh, some of the bermudas, if you cut half the height off of them, you're left with brown twigs. You know, think of a pine forest. Uh, you, you see all these trunks when you're walking through it and flying over the top, it's all green tops. If you were to cut all those trunks off halfway, what would it look like? Uh, and that's how it is with Bermuda. You're left with these browned shoots. They're alive, they're healthy, but they're not where the leaves are. And so cutting it back like that really sets it back. So mowing frequency, as much as we don't want to hear that, is the most important thing, I think, to creating a beautiful, dense, healthy lawn. Now, we live on a seven-day schedule. We just do. I guess if you're retired, maybe you could kind of uh, change that a little bit. But in general, the world runs on a seven-day schedule. So uh, if you try to mow over five days, eventually you're going to be, you know, mowing on Wednesdays and Tuesdays and Mondays and Fridays and Thursdays. And you see what I'm saying? And that that's kind of difficult. So we go with a seven-day schedule. It works really good with St. Augustine. Some of the others would benefit a little bit from uh, being mowed more often. The, the key to mowing is you want to mow at a height that cuts off this is for a home lawn that cuts off about one third of the leaf blade or the height of the grass. So if you had grass that was three inches high and you mowed it to two inches, you're taking off a third. And then next time it gets up to three, you mow it back to two. And, and then it, the smaller it gets, like I'm gonna go extreme here, but let's say that it was one inch high, you would cut it back to two thirds of an inch high. Well, how long does it take to grow one third of an inch? not as long as it takes to grow a whole inch, right? Uh, and so the point being that the, the lower you mow, the more often you have to mow in, in general. And, and so we go with about a seven day schedule and we do our best on that. Uh, try to keep a little bit, you, you try to find the sweet spot in mowing height and each species is a little different. St. Augustine, I like letting it go to three inches and cutting it back to two, two and a half. I've, I've even had mine get a little taller than three, uh, but uh, in general, that's that's that for uh, zoysia and Bermuda grass. Depending on the variety and the cultivar and the species of zoysia, uh, that can range a little bit. But generally, I'm trying to keep those in about the two-inch level uh, after mowing. Um, you can go lower, but it, it would look great. But the mowing schedule is kind of tough. Uh, so anyway, two, two and a half at the most. Uh, again, depending on on varieties and growing conditions and and species so mowing regularly uh, with a good sharp mower did you know a sharp mower makes the grass greener i'll let that sink in for just a minute now here's why here's why i say that uh, if you've ever looked at a pixelated television screen we don't really have to deal with that much anymore or maybe a newsprint that has color pictures on the newsprint and you get in real close with a magnifying glass, what do you see? You see all these different colors and pixels that make the color that from a distance, from arm's length, you're perceiving as just normal color. But up close, it's all pixelated. So now imagine that you've got a grass blade and you give it a good clean cut and it'll turn a little bit tan at the tip uh, from that. And then imagine on the other hand, you've got a very dull mower blade and it just 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 basically hacks the top off that grass blade and leaves it uh, just split and splintered and, and, and you get a big brown tip uh, from that kind of, of uh, damage. Multiply that times a billion grass blade tips in your lawn and it, it 
does lessen the color a little bit. It's not huge. I mean, it doesn't make the whole lawn look brown. But a good sharp mower sure makes a nice, and it's better for the grass too, that's for sure. So mowing, mowing, mowing. All right, watering. We got to water uh, when it doesn't rain. And most people overwater their lawns. Or let me say it this way. Most people miswater their lawns. So what's the difference? Well, overwatering is giving the grass more water than it needs. And that, get, that happens a lot. Uh, when I first moved to Houston uh, for my extension job there, we lived in, up in the Cypress area. And uh, I had a neighbor who ran his water every other day. And this was in Houston where it rains a lot. And I mean, every other day, it was going to run the irrigation. And also, his system was so messed up, his sprinkler heads were so misaligned that they sprayed my car in my driveway. So I, I always uh, jokingly said that I parked backwards on some days to wash the other side of the car uh, <laughs> because he was literally, I mean, literally, it was, it was watering my car in my driveway. Uh, we water too much, uh, but we also water incorrectly. So what, what does correct mean? Correct means get about an inch of water in the soil. And how do you do that? Well, you in a clay soil, you got to water pretty slowly, or you have to water multiple times with a sl with a short uh, soak-in cycle between the two. And work summer is coming. I know right now everybody's happy. You you ought not even be watering your grass probably. I haven't watered mine yet. But um, so the idea would be uh, rather than give a little squirt every day, that little squirt barely wets the grass and the thatch and the surface of the soil. Uh, and then when you turn the water off, what happens to the water in the grass blades and in the thatch? It evaporates away. Nobody comes along and squeegees it off the, gr the, the grass blades. So a big percentage of your irrigation water just made Bryan College Station more humid. Thank you very much. And uh, so instead of that, if you kept the water running, and you got an inch in the ground, you're still going to have the wet, when the sprinkler goes off, you're still going to have wet surfaces. But after those are wet, you've got water moving down and percolating into the soil. So you get more out of your water dollar when you give it a good soaking. Now, in slopes and on clay soils, it is very difficult to put an inch, well, you basically, I would just say you can't, put an inch of water down and have it soak in if you put an inch down at one time. So what we do is call cycle and soak. And what does that mean? It means turn the sprinkler on and observe how long can this sprinkler run uh, before you start to see runoff. And your water cycle should be a little less than that. And then you, you set it to go off for 45 minutes, about, give or take, and let that water soak in and then come back on again. And through cycle and soak, through a series of those, you can get a good deep soaking. Now in a clay, it's a little more practical to try to get at least a half inch on uh, if you can. But uh, in, a, in a sandy soil especially, uh, you know, the water's going to move really quickly through and the cycle and soak isn't going to be um, as common of a practice. Although, again, depending on the features of your landscape, it, it may need to be done that way. So watering, watering deeply and then infrequently. Every time you wet a plant's foliage, you increase the incidence of disease. If you want to see black spot and every powder, even powder and mildew on roses, just spray them every day with, with a pop-up irrigation spray head. Uh, and that humidity will promote the powdery mildew and the wetness will promote the black spot. And so that combination is just unnecessary. Give it a good soaking, let it dry off. I like to water early in the morning because after the water goes off, the sun is coming up, it's warming up, the wind's picking up, and it dries out pretty quickly. Uh, that's compared to mowing, let's say, at 7 o'clock in the evening, and uh, it essentially sits wet for a much longer time. So mowing, watering, and then finally now, fertilizing. Oh, by the way, on, on watering, I have to say one more thing. It is important when you water to have good even coverage. And we can't have perfect coverage uniformity. The systems we have just don't quite lend themselves to that. But we can certainly get a lot closer. And if you turn on an irrigation system, you should see one sprinkler head throw water all the way to where another sprinkler head has popped up. So in other words, they are overlapping each other completely. That gives the best coverage for, for uniformity. 
Uh, now, a lot of times, one sprinkler head's water drops and stops right about where the other sprinkler head's water stops. And now in the middle there, you've got a spot that's going to be dry, and you're going to water a lot more, wasting water on areas that got enough water, trying to keep the dry spots adequately watered and moist. In a summer like last summer, we waste a lot of water for that. And then there's all the issues of a system being uh, in good shape, uh, like I mentioned, the misaligned heads and uh, many other issues that can happen. So you want to water in the most efficient way you can with a good deep soaking. Uh, I have a little chart uh, that I did um, that shows water use through the year here in the Bryan College Station area. And in the winter, uh, we really don't need water. I mean, there can be situations where it's extended drought and we do have kind of warm winter temperatures and it gets a little bit on the dry side. But in general, just say don't water in winter. That That's pretty given. Uh, in the spring, we were looking more at a need of about a half inch a week, about a half inch. Then when summer comes, uh, the brunt of summer, we're looking at an inch a week. And then when we get to fall, we go back to a half inch a week. Uh, and it's all temperature related as to when we do this. Uh, but that's the way you can save water and have a beautiful lawn. The third step, mow water fertilize, uh, is fertilizing. And there are fertilizers that we talk about as turf fertilizers. Uh, years ago, uh, here at Texas A&M, and really at many uh, land-grant institutions across the South, uh, really across the country, uh, turf specialists, turf researchers, determined that in general, a 3-1-2 or 4-1-2 ratio of nutrients is a good thing to put on your turf. That is kind of typical to what you might find in clippings. And uh, it, it's basically the ratio that grass needs. Grass does not take up as much phosphorus or need as much phosphorus as nitrogen, for example. Uh, and so that middle number doesn't need to be high. Uh, years and years ago, uh, the main thing people said was triple 13. That, when I say people said, I don't mean turf specialists. Uh, and triple 13 over time gets us into trouble with super high phosphorus levels and therefore iron chlorosis being worse. So you want about a 3-1-2 ratio. Now, that's the shooting from the hip best guess that's right most of the time. However, you will find in your yard the nutrient levels may be different, and that may not be the best fertilizer for you. So for example, uh, well, years ago, I did a study in northwest Austin, and there's a black clay soil uh, there, and we looked at 200, we soil tested two hundred homes. There was not one home in the 200 that needed phosphorus, the middle number. A lot of them didn't need much potassium. It was surprisingly high, uh, but potassium uh, doesn't tie up and stay there as much as phosphorus does, nor it as volatile as, as nitrogen. But still, uh, it was very educational seeing the fact that these nutrient levels were very high. So for a lot of people in those situations, you may look at a one zero zero ratio, something that just has nitrogen. Uh, and then when we get to the fall, maybe something with a little phosphorus going in. And I don't want to complicate this, but I'm just saying that a soil test is the best way to know what, what you need to put on your lawn. And if you don't have a soil test, go with a 3-1-2 ratio or a 4-1-2 ratio. But get a soil test. You're fertilizing blind if you don't have a soil test. So uh, I hope I've uh, establish that that's important. Uh, so we're talking about lawns, mow water fertilize, and then the importance of a soil test. Let's talk a little bit about uh, warm weed, uh, lawn weeds. Uh, right now, you're seeing an explosion of weeds in your lawn. And unfortunately, they have little flowers on them, which turn into seeds, which turn into 20 years of weeding. So what do we do? Well, every weed you see right now that's a prominent weed, that's a cool season weed. And those, think of our blue bonnet, our state flower. It sprouts in the fall and stays there as a little tiny rosette. Uh, grows a little bit in the winter, but not a lot. And then when spring comes, it takes off growing, gets really tall and, and blooms. We appreciate that. And then it sets seeds and casts them all over the place. And we appreciate that because we like blue bonnets. Well, weeds do the same thing. And these cool season weeds, if you can catch them before they take off growth, you can use post-emergent uh, 
broadleaf weed control products to control m most of the of the weeds that we're dealing with. Things like chickweed, a uh, henbit. Um, let's see, there's uh, cleavers or what's the other name for that? Bed straw, catchweed, or something like that. Uh, that's another cool season weed. Clover is a cool season weed. Those all, when you catch them early before they start to bloom and set seed, uh, you can control them with a broadly post emergent product. One that would maybe hurt your lawn when it's the heat of summer, but won't in the cool. Uh, that would be kind of a February application. We've passed that now. Uh, so you could still use them, but you probably have already got some seeds that are forming. So just look at your plants, look at your lawn weeds and stuff, and that's what I would recommend. Um, it, then right about now is when our warm season weeds germinate. It probably started this year about the uh, last week of February or so. I haven't been keeping up with soil temps, but when they hit about 55 degrees, we start to see weed germination. We've got things like crabgrass, for example, uh, that'll take off germinating then. Uh, and then uh, grass burr is another warm season annual weed that we have to deal with. And so you put a pre-emergent down to prevent those from establishing. So here's what happens. Different product chemistries work different, but uh, a lot of the ones that are recommended uh, for lawn and sold for lawn pre-emergent control uh, are going to, when the weed seed tries to sprout and get a root down in the ground, uh, it in, it it goes after the chemical is there on the surface and it prevents that weed seed from establishing a plant. It inhibits the root growth. And th what has to happen in order for that to work, if you're going to use a, pr a pre-emergent before the weeds come up, not spraying to kill weeds that you see, but spraying to prevent weeds that you don't yet see. Those things need to be watered in, typically about a half inch of irrigation, uh, just to move it down into the soil surface. So that's that's what's the the key element on those. Those products can can work, and uh, there's timing on them. Uh, typically in the Bryan College Station area, we're looking at probably a late February application of those products. You could still do it. You may you may have a few weed that escape, but then you may have some that you still prevent. Uh, and then we do it again in probably late September. Uh, maybe early October, I would say late September, you want to get them down and water them in to prevent the cool season weed germination, which starts up at that time. Now, having said that, I, I spent a little bit of time there telling you what is the, how do they work uh, on a weed that's trying to germinate. We have a bad problem uh, with the concept of if a teaspoon's good, a tablespoon's better. I know that. I have operated out of that philosophy before. I get it, I get it, but it's not true. What is best for controlling weeds is what it says on the label. The label is the law. That is what's best. When you start double or triple dosing things, you end up with problems. And this is true, it can be true with insecticides, or fungicides, and her certainly true with herbicides. I saw a tree one time uh, that I got called out to a site and they had they had put down, uh, this was a, a pre-emergent product, I believe it was an atrazine product, uh, based product, but they had fertilized their lawn with a weed and feed that was an atrazine base, and then they had more left. So they just went back across the lawn, continuing, and they ended up running out right underneath the tree. And you could look, the rains came that night, it was a good gully washer, got down in the ground pretty far, and you could look at that tree by the time they called me out and you could draw a line through the tree visually as to where, where, the, where they stopped in that double application of that product. Uh, and that's, that's important to know. You can damage, you can damage woody ornamentals. Uh, and, uh, you, but also, when you do that, you'll damage your lawn. I went to another, these are just, this, today's become story day. Let me tell you my war stories. Well, another time I went to a lawn and they were ta describing these problems and I looked at it and they had to take all root rot. Uh, but as I began examining it, you could pick up a runner and maybe for three feet there wasn't a root in the ground. That's not how St. Augustine's supposed to be. It's got a, you should get a root about ever two inches or depending on the growth rate and the cultivar. Uh, and what was happening is they had, um, had a lawn service that put out a pre-emergent. And then they fired that lawn service and got a new lawn service who showed up and put out a pre-emergent. 
<laughs> and then they saw some weeds that were coming up and they had them come back again and it had three applications and who knows what rate they were using but three applications of a pre-emergent herbicide and the grass could the St. Augustine lives on top of the ground it doesn't have the rhizomes underneath the ground uh, you know grass has stolons and rhizomes uh, but having the rhizomes underground the, to bounce back from like Bermuda grass and, and Mosoisia grass will do pretty good at that but St. Augustine lives on top and that runner big fat runner on top tries to put a root down at every node and if they've got if you've got a good bar, uh, barricade covering coating force fuel whatever you want it of the of the uh, pre-emergent there and it's overdone especially it can get a root through it it just can't now that product will break down in time but the more you overdose it the longer it's going to take to be safe for a plant to get a root in the ground again and so don't do that uh, because if you've got a grass struggling with drought if you've got a grass struggling with take all root rot uh, now you've got a grass that is losing its old roots and the new roots can't get in the ground so how does that turn out you might as well pull a runner up and throw it on the driveway in July and see how that turns out that's exactly essentially what's happening so if, if a, teasp a tablespoon is not better than a teaspoon let me just leave it at that uh, and please take advantage of that and uh, follow the label carefully and let me just give you one more argument uh, to try to convince everybody that this is true if you're making a herbicide to, to prevent weeds or kill weeds wouldn't you want to sell a lot of it so why wouldn't you just move that label up where instead of a teaspoon you're telling people to put a tablespoon on because you sell three times as much herbicide right well there's a reason why these companies know if they did that they would be paying for a lot of damaged lawns <laughs> because that rate is not acceptable so even from an economic standpoint it makes sense that the label is what it is there's a reason for the label well forgive me for that uh, soapbox rant I wasn't shaking my finger I, I, I promise you I was not here in the studio shaking my finger but I almost feel that way let's talk a little bit about um, the oh <laughs> one last thing about weed control and lawn the hotter it gets, the broadleaf weed control products begin to damage your St. Augustine lawn. And they can there are products that can damage other types of lawns as well. Most lawns here are St. Augustine, so I'll just talk about that one. Once it hits about 85 degrees, a lot of these products will damage your lawn to varying degrees. How much did you use? What's the temperature? And is the lawn stressed or not? And there's other factors. But the best time to work on broadleaf weeds is in the spring when they wake up but before it gets hot uh, and let's say you were going to have some 90 degree days you can still use them just do it early in the morning before the temperature goes up and let it get on the grass and, or weeds and then start to dry out uh, but watch out for that uh, this is we we're above 85 degrees a lot of the year here uh, in Texas and so something to look at uh, let's talk a little bit about species of grass some people lost their lawns this past year or lost so much of the lawn that they're just going to replace it uh, St. Augustine's the most common it puts up with shade better than anything St. Augustine uh, in shade does not need much water uh, I, I uh, have, have seen lawns when a city was under stage two drought restrictions where the whole lawn out in the sun was dead and underneath some oaks and, and trees the lawn was green and it all had the same amount of water and, and which means none uh, and that green lawn underneath the shade held on because the demands are so low compared to demands in the full sun so St. Augustine uh, is uh, people talk about you know St. Augustine waste water to bag grass and things well every plant has its pros and cons and St. Augustine's pro is that it is very good in the shade and it is forgiving of a little bit of an irregular, irregular mowing schedule uh, and can make a very beautiful, uh, beautiful lawn. Zoysia grass, uh, there's a couple of species of zoysia. And one is a broader leaf, uh, still just a fraction of the width of St. Augustine. Uh, and then one is very, very fine leafed. And those both can make beautiful lawns. They require a, a very frequent mowing. A more frequent mowing than St. Augustine I should say it that way with a good sharp mower 
and the lower you go at some point you have to use a real type mower like the the candy cane stripe blade going around as opposed to a propeller blade uh, I always think of it when you say real mower well, does that mean an actual mower or no it means it means a real type mower and uh, this is true of golf courses you don't see them a propeller blade mower on the greens of a golf course uh, it's a little real type and and those do a little better with that they don't require it especially the the taller uh, some of the taller less dwarf types so anyway that's an option uh, zoysia cyanoxia and then there's bermuda grass and we have some wonderful bermudas uh, you see just about every football field in texas it's actual grass is going to be a type of bermuda just about well, I think all the golf courses, I'm sure there's some exceptions, but are, are going to be a type of Bermuda. And they ma it makes one of the most beautiful lawns. If you fertilize it frequently and water it uh, enough to keep the vigor and mow it regularly and low, Bermuda grass makes a gorgeous lawn. Uh, one of the drawbacks to it, uh, if you got kids or you just like to roll around in the grass and, and you know, on a sunny, sunny summer day with a, with a weed seed in your mouth, you know, one of those little straws, uh, Bermuda grass gets chiggers in it a lot. And I've never had that problem to that degree with St. Augustine. Uh, but boy, you come in itching uh, in Bermuda, or you can in Bermuda grass. Uh, so that's one of the things I'm not real crazy about about it. We have some new St. Augustine varieties. Texas A&M recently released one called Cobalt. Cobalt is an excellent variety. It has many features, one of which is some drought resilience. Uh, it, it does very well. I won't go into detail on all the features of all these grasses. Uh, they also, in, in coordination with Scott's, released one called Provista. And Provista, and these are going to be a little more difficult to find. Uh, this is true with any plant. When new varieties come out, I don't care if it's a tomato or St. Augustine, it, you're going to find the old varieties around, and uh, the new varieties take a little time to, to make it into uh, widespread acceptance and, and uh, availability. Uh, Pro Vista though with Scott's has many great features as well. So I'm not going to go into all the details on that. I just want to say that if, you're, if you've got a lawn and it's shady and it's St. Augustine and it's not getting dense, at some point you probably need to consider something other than a lawn there. Uh, because St. Augustine puts up with more shade than other grass, but there's a point where it starts to decline. And it's very difficult to have density in the shade. It's very difficult. Uh, I tend to mow a little higher there, uh, leave a little more leaf blade to catch what little sunlight there is. But if you've got foot traffic, St. Augustine already is not great, but stepped on all the time compared to some other grasses. And I just think in the at, at that point, it's probably be you're probably best just to put something else there. You can trim the trees, but they just grow back and that's not a very long-term way of getting more light into the grass. So go with a ground cover or uh, there's just a lot of other options like bark mulches and shrubs and, and whatnot that could be put in there. All right, well, we spent a lot of time on lawns, but remember the big three, tree star or tree starf and tomatoes. Uh, trees, if you planted a tree last fall, uh, or let's just say if a tree has been in less than a year or about a year, uh, going in, to this warm season, you should be watering the new tree uh, about twice a week uh, if it was planted last fall. If it was planted the spring before, probably once a week would be adequate. These plants come in a little cylinder of soil and the roots are all wrapped up in there. And so we want to cut those roots and put it in the ground. But uh, it's going to take time for that tree to have the root system it would have. Because if you, if you had a tree, let's say you bought a tree that's eight feet high, it's going to have roots probably 20 feet in all directions had it grown in that spot originally. Like let's say it's an oak and had an acorn sprouted. It's going to have roots way out. But you've got roots in a little five-gallon bucket size cylinder or whatever size you bought. Uh, and it takes time and they're not resilient when they don't have a large volume of soil from which to draw water and nutrients. So... Uh, don't be afraid to water. You don't want to keep them soggy. You don't want to turn it into a swamp. If you planted the, the tree this spring, or if you plant even in early summer, then we're looking at an, probably every other day uh, uh, watering. I, I, it's hard to draw uh, you know generalizations, but I would say consider how many gallons the, the tree was in the container, the 
tree container and give it about that many gallons of water twice a week. Uh, so if it was in a five gallon bucket, equivalent of that, and they don't grow them in five gallon buckets, uh, then it would get five gallons twice a week. Uh, that would be one way to go about it. Now, tree species, soil type, there's a lot of variables, but at least that gives you an idea. I like to put a berm of soil around trees, like a big donut, uh, and it's about four or five inches high because it's going to settle down. And you can put a couple of inches of water in it and give a nice, good, deep soaking. Uh, the donut should be bigger than the root cylinder was. Now, that's a, a great way to rescue trees, especially when we go into some difficult times. But anyway, there's a little bit on trees. Uh, let's talk about vegetable gardens. Uh, we have, uh, I do what, before I do that, I want to I wanna look. I had a couple of questions. Uh, while I was on my long trip away, long time away, uh, as I transitioned from extension work to being retired, the, um, I had a question, some, several questions came in from Paul about can we, can we start seedlings now? Can we grow like tomato plants now? What, what's, the, what's the time? Well, in general, you would like to start things about uh, tomatoes and peppers about six, maybe eight weeks before you're going to plant them outdoors. So here that would be about mid-March, so you're probably looking, or early March, depending on the year and your willingness to gamble. Uh, so you're talking about starting them in mid to late January. For best results, you can just start them a little later. Now, if you plant a tomato now, it'll grow, but by the time it's able to set fruit, it's going to be so hot, unless it's a cherry, and then it may set some fruit. Uh, so I generally don't recommend uh, you know, starting them from seed at this point. We can transition over and start some things that would be direct seeded from seed. For example, cucumbers and the, all the cucurbit family, cucumbers, uh, musk melons or cantaloupes, watermelons, summer squash, winter squash, pumpkin, those kind of things. We could start them in a little four inch pot and get them up and going just maybe two or three weeks and then move them right out into the soil uh, to be planted. They don't like being pot bound, so don't leave them too long in there. But you could start those kinds of things indoors right now. If you go to the Master Gardener website here in Brazos County, the Brazos County Master Gardener website, uh, it there is a chart on there, a green checkerboard that's January through December and a list of all the vegetables and it tells you when to plant them. It's something I put together a good while back. Uh, it's got the okay time to plant, the best time to plant, and then at the end of it there's another okay time to plant uh, for each of those. And I would use that as my guide as far as when I'm going to plant what. Uh, that That's probably the best approach to that. We also had a question uh, from Aaron, uh, has cedars turn brown? And, you know, we've had this question a lot. Uh, cedars and post oaks both have taken quite a hit these last couple of years. Uh, we've had three years ago, we had that horrible freeze that did damage that then led to issues down the road. Uh, we've had an early December freeze uh, a year ago, a year and a quarter ago. Uh, and that damaged our crepe myrtles. We saw some kill back to the ground, the re-sprouting from the base. We've had some brutal summers, a couple of summers that were just brutal. And it's taken a toll on a lot of our plants. And uh, cedar trees are normally tough. So are post oaks out in nature. You see them in the post oak belt just growing. And that's a very gravelly soil. It's a, They deal with the horrible weather extremes that we can have here in Texas, and they do well. And same with, with the eastern red cedar. But this last year was too much for a lot of them. And sometimes you'd see three together and one dies and the other two don't. Why is that? I don't have a good answer to that. I could just, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, venture a guess of, well, they're number one, they're all genetically different because they're all coming from seeds originally. Uh, number two, there could be other issues that one tree has that you don't even see that are going on with it. But the bottom line is uh, they died. Uh, and, and that's post oaks, once they get stressed, uh, if they don't die outright, hypoxylin canker, a fungal disease that knocks the bark off and leaves a, a one of several colors underneath it, either an olive drab dust or a silvery hard material or a black tar-like material, uh, that just is because the tree was stressed. When a cedar tree or a pine tree 
uh, any kind of a juniper arborvitae, those kinds of plants, and then the, 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 the needled evergreens and then the scaly leaf types evergreens. When a branch turns brown, it, it doesn't re-sprout. So Christmas tree growers, if they're pruning, and you know they've created this conical shape to the tree, which we think of as a Christmas tree shape, if they were to shear back past all those living needles, that would be a brown dead spot in the plant that never recovers. I mean, it never closes back over. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I don't like the big, beautiful Italian cypress that are long, tall, skinny, those things, because inevitably diseases and bagworms and spider mites and other things are going to turn sections brown. And when you do, you just had you just lost a huge chunk of green in what should be a nice, beautiful, upright plant. Uh, and 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 when that happens, that's the case. So for a cedar tree, for example, if you were to go out and take any other tree and cut off all the ends of branches on the tree, it would start resprouting near every cut, and it would be back in business again. If you do that to a cedar, you just have a hat rack, and it'll never it'll never come back. It cannot resprout. So when cedars get into problems like we've been through. Uh, turning to toast is normal response, and I know we don't want that, but that that's kind of what's happening. Uh, if I want to, uh, I want to talk a little bit about. Let's see, that was trees. I want to go back to the vegetable garden. Uh, if you're growing tomatoes, I often get a, a question: uh, Do I should I prune my tomatoes, or should I stake them, or cage them, or what? Well, um, if you pr if you prune them. If you prune all the suckers off and just have one stem coming up and you stake it, the tomatoes you get are going to be a little earlier and they're going to be they're going to start producing a little earlier and they're going to be a little bit larger, not a lot of competition. If you leave a lot of suckers and you cage it, you're going to get more tomatoes that'll tend to be a little bit smaller and they'll be it'll be later before you start getting tomatoes and it's just all the competition cuz every time a tomato stem puts out a leaf it has a shoot right there where the leaf attaches to the stem so what I'll do is I'll start off without suckers and then I may leave uh two or three uh and let them come up and and continue to remove the extras and you can kind of get a feel for it depending on the vigor of the variety you have uh but unsuckered tomatoes in a cage that cage is so dense with green foliage that air can't move through there therefore more disease issues uh, you you just can't get in there and and like if you had to spray you couldn't get a spray in in there so some suckering is important uh, and most people don't do the the prune and put it on a stake uh, anymore uh, but you can you absolutely can. When you're choosing tomatoes, for those of you who haven't planted yet, I said it's too late to start them from seed. It's not too late to buy a plant. Uh, and if you're choosing varieties, uh, cultivars, I, you know, cultivar is a proper term. I, I, we all say variety, and so I still say variety because some people don't know what a cultivar is. But when you're choosing cultivars, the faster the better, pretty much. If you can get a tomato between 65 and 72 or 75 maybe days somewhere in there maybe say 72 days that is going to get you the best yields because once we get temperatures up in the 90s and the night times rise up into the upper 70s near 80 well those that combination of upper 70s and hot days both of those cause problems with pollination and the big slicers don't set fruit well the the grapes and the cherries do okay uh, but so if you have a brandy wine, everybody's heard of brandy wine probably if you're a gardener, uh, it's because it's supposed to be a good old fashioned heirloom. Uh, well, uh, brandy wine can take 80 days or 82 days uh, to reach its harvest. And so you will get some tomatoes, but about the time they set and then they ripen, it's getting too hot for many more to set. So your yields are much, much less. Uh, unless you start them indoors, maybe you plant them first of January to get an extra head start and you have indoor lights where you can bump them up to bigger containers and have something with blooms and fruit on it when you put it out. Well, not fruit, but blooms on it when you put it out. Uh, th that would be a good idea. So wh what do we choose? We mostly choose fast varieties. There is a variety called Celebrity that I like a lot uh, because it has some disease resistance that's important. Uh, after a tomato, you see letters after the cultivar name. And it'll say 
uh, it'll say VFN or VF1, F2, or V2, uh, and, and, and what that means is VFN is verticillium, which is a fungal root disease, fusarium, which is a fungal root disease, and nematodes, which attack the roots, and its resistance to those. Now, there are very few nematode-resistant tomatoes on the home market that you find. Uh, nematodes are a problem in, typically in sandy soil, but they can occur in other soils. Uh, and they're, they're really damaging, and there's not a good cure for them. So celebrity happens to be a VFN. Now, it doesn't mean it doesn't get any disease at all. No, it, it can. But at least you're making your gamble a little bit better in your favor when you do that. Uh, early varieties and good disease resistance is important. So things like early blight, that's one of the fungal diseases. You typically see it starting on the older leaves, uh, and you'll see uh, yellowing, and then with a brown center and a yellow around it, uh, the big old spots that are kind of irregular in their shape, uh, that's early blight. Uh, there are other tomato diseases and things that uh, can attack uh, fungally and bacterially. Uh, some attack uh, the 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 bacteria-wise, they may attack the flow through the plant, the plumbing. They gum up the plumbing of the plant. Uh, but in general, if you get good, healthy varieties, you take care of them and things, these diseases are not as bad. I like to keep the soil mulched to avoid uh, uh, the soil splashing from rain and irrigation, splashing up on the leaves. If you see older leaves that are affected, go ahead and pull them off. Just know that the leaves that still look green that you left, they probably have spores that are also in the process of early process of that disease's development. Uh, so don't be surprised if you pull off all the disease leaves if you see more disease leaves in time. Uh, among the insects on tomatoes, uh, we got the big three, really. Actually, there's, I could say, four. Uh, one, one that was my fourth is uh, some of the caterpillars that attack. There's the tomato horn worm that attacks and eats a lot of foliage. There are various kinds of caterpillars that attack the fruit, uh, one that makes a little pin, pinhole uh, in the fruit, some that eat out big chunks of the fruit. And those can be a problem. Uh, in general, they're easy to manage if you get ahead of them with sprays of BT or something like that. The other three are aphids. Aphids like tender new growth. Typically on tomatoes, your aphids are going to be kind of pinkish in color. That's the most common. Uh, and then spider mites, and I'll save the last one for just a moment. Uh, aphids and spider mites are small, soft-bodied pests, and insecticidal soap sprays work well on small, soft-bodied pests. So there are other products that will kill aphids, but a lot of the insecticides cause an outbreak in spider mites. Seven, carbaryl is the worst uh, for several reasons in causing a spider mite outbreak. Number one, it kills everything that that um, would eat the spider mite, its natural enemies, including beneficial mites. Did you know there was such a thing? Uh, it also enhances mite reproduction and increases nitrogen levels in the leaf. Did you know that? But about seven. So it, it's not a good one. Some of the uh, organophosphates, um, and uh, certain other chemicals also can be very good for controlling the insects but uh, cause outbreaks of the spider mite. So I like to use insecticidal soap or actually, uh, unless you have a lot of tomatoes, if you get a blast of water from underneath the plant, blasting the bottom sides of the leaves, you've done enough of that sucker pruning so you can get to the leaves uh, and uh, just blast them off. And you should, if you do that once every couple of weeks, uh, it keeps them in check. Remember, we don't have to have a pest-free garden. We just need to not have an outbreak that reaches a point of, you know, we're at a commercial patch, we would say it, it is economically advantageous to begin to spray. That's part of the integrated pest management approach. But in the backyard, we're just holding them back. That's all we're, we're needing to do now for the big insect. That is the stink bug slash leaf-footed bug. Stink bugs look like a little shield. Leaf-footed bugs are black, longer, and they have on their hind legs a broad section that sort of looks like a piece of leaf. Well, when you have those kinds of things around, they're tough. And the, the adults, uh, you're not going to kill them with insecticidal soap or horticultural oil or a lot of the organic products are just not going to work on those. And some of the synthetics are not uh, working as well. Plus, the little things have wings and they fly all over the place. And now they're coming in. You, 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 
you, you spray your what's on your plant, but you don't get them all. Uh, and so they're a problem. What I would recommend on those is a couple of things. Number one, learn what they look like in all life stages. And we should know that about our pests anyway. Now, gardening is fun and gardening is educational. So don't just be, you know, somebody who says, well, what do I spray? What do I spray for everything? Learn about these and you may find that when you are out there and you see aphids, you also see some little yellow elongated footballs about the size of an aphid that are lady beetle eggs. And so now you can make a management decision. You don't have to spray the aphids. That's lady beetle food, lady beetle larva and adult food. Uh, that's just an example of what I'm talking about. So on the stink bugs and the leaf footed bugs, their eggs are very distinct. Stink bugs, their eggs look like little barrels. So if you imagine a bunch of wine barrels sitting upright, all grouped together, that's kind of the shape of stink bug eggs. Uh, the the um, harlequin bug that gets on your coal crops, broccoli and things, it's going to be getting on soon as it warms up. Uh, those, their, their barrel-shaped eggs, look like uh, zebras with black and orange stripes. So isn't that unique? Well, get out and learn what they look like. Leaf-footed bugs, uh, their eggs look like a series of little shingles or plates sitting on maybe a stem or a petiole of a, of a tomato. And uh, when they hatch out, they have little orange and black spidery leg. They don't have the leaf foot when they're hatched out. The, and they tend to cluster in groups. Uh, so just a real quick generalization. And whenever I generalize, you know, the more you generalize, the more there's exceptions and you're not always, it's not 100% true. But in general, uh, predator bugs, they eat living things, including each other in many cases. So when they hatch out, they tend to disperse and not hang out together very long. The plant feeding bugs tend to stay together as a little herd, and that's true with the leaf-footed bug. Uh, they, you'll see these black and orange spidery things on the leaf, and they're kind of all together, maybe on a tomato or on the leaf or stem, and they're all together. Well, that, that's one sign that that's probably a pest bug. Uh, the simplest thing to do, once you know what they look like, if you know what eggs look like, you can rub them off or take a snippers and clip that leaf off. If you know what the little ones look like, put a little pail of soapy water underneath and swat the branch or the tomatoes with your hand and knock them all off into the soapy water. And there you just did it. They don't have wings. They can't fly away. But if you delay until they do have wings, you got a bigger problem on your hand. It's much more difficult uh, to control. And that's a nemesis. The other nemesis of our tomatoes is, is our beautiful state bird, the mockingbird. It's not the only bird that'll peck a tomato, but um, you, they go out and they peck, and I wish they would just pick one tomato and they would all get together and eat it. I would give them three tomatoes if they would all just do that. But nope, they got to take a peck out of this one and a peck out of that one, and even green tomatoes have a peck out of them uh, sometimes, and that's a problem. Um, they're not a good way in the city to control mockingbirds. Uh, let me just put it this way. Law enforcement and your neighbors would disapprove of the way that comes to my mind first. <laughs> but, but, all right, all right. Don't, don't email me. Um, so what do you do? I, I've had some gardeners tell me that organza bag, organza drawstring bags work well for that. Now, you just go online, I don't know, you know, Amazon or whatever you use and just do a search for organza drawstring bags. They come in different sizes. You can get a little four by six bag or, or bigger ones or smaller ones. And uh, if it's a cluster of tomatoes, just put them, put them over the whole cluster. You pull the drawstring and now they just hang out there and air moves through, water moves through. You can see through them, uh, but the pests can't get into them. And I'm told that, that the birds don't tend to bother them as much with those on them. I don't think that's probably true with squirrels, but one of you Find out and tell me this summer on yours if you've had a problem with those. Well, that's a lot about vegetables. Uh, we, can, we can talk about other things when you're putting transplants out. And I'm just going to switch over and cover both flowers and vegetables here. You can direct seed into the ground. Uh, some plants are easiest direct seeded. The cucurbits I mentioned earlier, cucumbers and squashes, for example, those are easy, and melons, those are easiest to direct seed. Uh, flowers like zinnias and sunflowers, you can just direct seed them. And that means putting them in the garden. Plant a seed when you, when in doubt, read the label on the packet. When in doubt with that, uh, just put them about three or four times as deep as the seed is wide. 
and make sure that the soil is moist before you plant and then after you plant uh, gently rewater. You don't want to blast the seeds out of the ground. Transplanting is what most people do. Uh, you go buy your little six pack of transplants or whatever, put them in the ground and I always recommend watering them in with a solution of water that contains nutrients. Now it can contain other things. There are other compounds that come in these solutions, uh, but you want to water them in with that really well because they need to be watered in, number one, but also it's a very dilute solution. And I'm talking about the lowest label rate dilute solution. Uh, if it is a salt-based product, then you don't want it too concentrated. You can burn plants with it. Uh, but in general, water them in. About a week later, water them again with the same thing. And then a week later, water them again. So after planting for two weeks, that would be a total of three applications of a good drench with a soluble plant food. Now we hope your soil has good nutrients in it. If it doesn't, get you a dry granular, mix it in the soil around the plants and uh, help that way. But that immediately available soluble food is really helpful. And I know using the word food is probably making uh, some professors crawl out of their skin because it's not plant food, but we all think of it that way. So I'll go with that for now. Fertilizer, how about that? Uh, putting that in, in the, around the roots helps them get off to a good start, and we need them to get off to a good start. Just like I said, you want to pick varieties that are fast. You want to plant them as early as you reasonably can, and then you want to take care of them so you get them up and going quickly. And don't forget, too, that containers are great. I see we're running out of time today. Oh, man, we're having fun, right? Uh, containers are a great way to grow things. But in general, we need bigger containers than you might think. If you watch gardening shows from cooler parts of the country, you may see a tomato growing in a little three or five gallon bucket. You can grow them in five gallon buckets if you sit there and water them twice a day in the, when the weather heats up. Go bigger, tomatoes, 10 gallons or 15 gallons uh, to, to get best results and avoid the stress that comes from getting a little too dry and going into a little bit of a drought stress. Uh, flowers, the same thing. Uh, you can put one flower in a container, but you can also do a mix of flowers that are just beautiful. Something tall in the center, something spilling over the sides, something filling in. We have so many good flowers right now that you can choose from. Color your landscape with containers because you can always take a container when it's not looking good, move it back, get your little dolly to stra dolly and strap to move it back where you don't have to lift it, put some new fresh flowers in it, get it going, and then wheel it back to its place. So it always looks like, yeah, beautiful, beautiful flowers and containers. Uh, and the same with, with uh, vegetables. You can grow a lot of vegetables in a container if it is of adequate size, and it always needs to drain well. Well, I bet I hear music. Yep, that's right. Okay, we're gone for today. We'll be back next week with a regular call-in show here on Garden Success. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to visiting with you again next week. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.